done in the past and what you're doing now, that would be great. Great. Well, I've had um, been in education for quite a long time. Um, I started off as a teacher um, in Glendale Hills, taught for 14 years. Uh, taught at the high school level, taught math. Uh, learning a lot of times when I tell people I taught math, the conversation kind of ends there. Um, but, um, and I also back in 1986, 87 when I started, I also taught some programming um, on Apple IIs um, one time ago. Um, I was a varsity basketball coach, varsity girls coach for golf, and varsity boys coach for golf also, uh, mathematics department chair. I moved into administration, was at the middle school level, was there for three years. Um, went to the high school for seven years. Bless you. Um, uh, I went to the high school as an associate principal for a couple of years, and then I moved from Lincoln Hills to Lampier High School in Nassau Heights, where I was the principal for seven years. Um, and now I am a, the deputy superintendent for curriculum and instruction in Lance Cruz. Um, but part of my experience, too, and it, this is not in your documentation, but um, you know, I was a varsity basketball coach, and right from the very beginning uh, of my career, I did summer basketball camps with kindergarten through third grade kids, and I have to tell you, it was a blast. And it, it's, it's still it's still going. It's not me doing it; it's my kids doing it now. Uh, but when I was a high school principal, when I was a high school teacher, that's what I did my summer time to spend time with you know, uh, elementary kids which is obviously the difference between the, um, the middle and high school. But I think that's one thing that's unique to me is that you know, I have experience at all different levels. Um, I have been in the classroom. Um, I have had success where I've been uh, in terms of the classroom I've had success, basketball for uh, as a building principal. Uh, we, uh, five years in a row, our ACT scores improved. Um, that is a, a pretty incredible feat. Um, I do have to say, um, Michael Fulham has a saying, and it is that there's no building, there's no school that's improving without a principal who knows school improvement. And, and I say that most humbly because um, it's, it's the teachers that are really doing the boots and the ground hard work. Uh, and it's the teachers that have the most influence over their students' success. I mean, there's clear research that says when students walk in that classroom, that teacher has the most influence over their education. However, there's also research that says right behind that, right behind that teacher is the building principal. But the building principal is affecting the whole school and not just that one classroom or those several class if you're a high school or middle school um, teacher. So now I'm a, I'm a teacher of principals. So I, I really you know, take my job seriously. I know how important it is. I know that you know, systems-wide professional development is important. And, um, and important to you know increasing student achievement and really um, improving the whole student experience. So I, I think those are some things that are unique that uh, that I can bring to our next year. Thank you. Uh, given what you know about our school district, could you tell us what you believe are the most immediate challenges that we face? Well, um, I have done a lot of research. I have talked to uh, several different people, administrators, teachers um, in Oxford, uh, community members. I know there's a, a lot of great things going on here. I know that there's a lot of initiatives that are pretty amazing. Uh, right now in Lots Cruz, we're investigating the IB program. I know it's infused here. Um, project Lead the Way. We're also investigating that. We've um, applied for some grants for Project Lead the Way. <laughs> it's infused here. Um, I know you have an international program. I know that uh, we're, we are, yeah, I have an international program as well. Um, we're probably a year, a year and a half behind you. We just had a board workshop yesterday about something very similar to what you're doing here. 
So, so what would be the first things? There's a lot going on, and from what I'm hearing is that this needs to continue. I mean, people like the IB program. Teachers, I'm hearing, like it. But I'm also hearing that there's some, there, people are overwhelmed also. Not everybody, but there's some of that. And that, <clears throat> that teachers need some time to have some deep understanding, some deep professional development, and sustained professional development. So I'm, I'm working on my another degree right now. I'm in a PhD program. Um, one of the classes I've take, taken is um, systems-wide professional development. And so I also come with some research-based you know, ideas for systems-wide professional development. And it's just not ideas, it's, it is research-based. It is, and that's what we have to do in education these days. It's, it's a lot different than when we went to school. Where we did things because we thought they were a good idea. You know, now we have, we're making decisions about what we're going to do with our students for student improvement, for, uh, for student achievement, uh, improving student achievement. It is more technical. You know, we are looking at research. We are looking at, at, at a lot of data. And we are looking at best practices. And then in a, in a collaborative way, we need to figure out what's best using the talent here, using our resources here, you know, to continue the district forward. But, but what I'm hearing is that, you know, the, the instructional piece needs some attention. And I'm, and I'm the person that can do that. Thank you. What are some specific capabilities or qualities that you would bring to this position that may set you apart from other candidates? Okay, okay. so um, <clears throat> like I said before, I, I have been um, a teacher. I still consider myself a teacher. Um, like I said before, I, you know, I'm now teaching principals. But I'm also teaching teachers and teaching kids. Uh, it, was, it was great to spend some time with a couple of students upstairs just now. Um, one of the things that, if you talk to people in my district, my former district, I'm, a, I'm an administrator, central office administrator, that gets in the buildings. Now it gets in the buildings, I know teachers. I know teachers in every one of our buildings. We have 10 elementary schools, four middle schools, four high schools. <coughs> alternative ed building, uh, a GED program for adult eds. Um, I don't know every single person, but I know a lot of them. We have over 600 teachers in our district. Um, I can walk into one of the high schools, and, I, and I'll know some kids. Um, when I first got there, just like when I first got to Lanphier, you know, people were a little wondrous about me being around. You know, what, what is the what's central office doing here? What's the principal doing in my classroom? But after a while, people understand that I'm there because I want to be there. Um, I want to see what the boots on the ground people are really doing. Uh, we have, <clears throat> I, uh, another thing I bring is, uh, is, is professional development. I have a great background in that, been very successful in that. Uh, there's a program called Classroom Instruction Works. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's research-based. It's the instructional strategies work. If they're done with fidelity, if they're done the way they're supposed to be done, if it's done with quality, you know, if there's a standard for having it, if it's done with focus, that if we're, we're intending to do this with a purpose, and if, if it's consistent, you know, if it can be replicated. So, I have all of our teachers, 600 teachers, going through this training. And it's going to take until the end of next year to do it, um, end of June 2016. But I'm also a person that walks the talk. I've been through the training. So when I'm in a teacher's classroom, you know, I can have conversations now, you know, about you know, some strategy they're doing, some kinesthetic activity with their student, some, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, cooperative learning. And, and I'll ask them if you've been through the CITW. And some will say, yeah. And others will say, no, I haven't yet. 
And, and the beauty about classroom instruction that works is that it is a lot of things that, there are a lot of things that teachers are already doing, but it's now making the unconscious things that they're doing conscious, knowing it really works, and then blowing that up, you know, and getting it just right. So, so those are some of the things. Um, then I can do question. Turn it over to the Secretary of for the next questions. Yeah. Um, how specifically would you go about establishing and maintaining communication with um, the public and public relations uh, in the community? How do you have a plan for that? Yeah, it's yes, I do, and it's it's very important. You know, people want to know what's going on. People want to hear what's happening. People are astounded sometimes because they don't understand or haven't heard about the programs we have. We have these great programs, and people haven't heard about it. It's it's happening in our district. It happened at Lancaster too, and I'm sure it's happening here. So it is part of it is a, a, a systematic way of communicating. You know, through a, a um, school messenger. I'm not sure if we have school master here, but there's email, phone calls, all that kind of stuff. Um, it, it through through the different activities we have at school, some purposeful ways to do this communicating. But then it's informal also. It is it's being at events. It's being available to to talk to people. It is being um, open and approachable. So for me, um, that's kind of who I am. I mean, at football games, I, I um, at concerts, I'm in buildings, uh, I'm in the community. Uh, and so part of that, it, it, it has to be everything. It can't be one thing or two things. There has to be several things to be part of this plan to get the good things that are happening, things that we want to write about out there. So. Thank you. Can you share with us um, specifics of ways that you accomplished communication in the community where you're at? Mm -hmm. Talking about successes or uh, problems. Right. So, um, <clears throat> again, there's some formal ways and some informal ways. But going to you know, PTOs, um, going to, uh, we have what we call parent advisory. So we have parent advisory on a regular basis. And part of that is to let parents know what we're doing, why we're doing it, budget sometimes, instruction sometimes, um, several different things, but then also the turnaround feedback. And um, when I first got there, and what I would, I would like to do here also, was to, is to start, um, start the superintendency with feedback, and not just from parents, but parents as well, but also teachers, administrators, different groups, students, and, and, and what are some of the great things that are happening here? And, and put that out there, <clears throat> and also put out there, what are some of our challenges? You know, what, what do we need to be working on? So, and, and it is a risk to do that, but if we really want to move to the next level, we have to ask the tough questions and be willing to want to hear the answers. So, um, so there are some formal things to do. There's some informal things to do. But I would start with um, having some dialogue in, in a way that we're asking the questions, good and bad. That sort of ties in with this next one, but I want you to be a little more specific. Um, what are some examples of community activities where, um, where you've been a part a participant or a leader of okay. that um, gets out there in ways that, that, you know, the accomplishments or problems with the district? Got it. So, um, and I'm going to give you a couple examples, and, and if this is what you're looking for. I'm looking for something specific. Okay, so um, I've always been a part of the coalition. And I don't know how strong your coalition is here, um, but when I was in Bloomfield Hills, I was a part of the coalition, the vice president. When I was in Lamphere, I was the president of the coalition. Here in Las Cruz, a huge coalition, uh, very well run, very well oiled. I'm a part of that, uh, stepping out in the community, the part of uh, 
dialogue day. We actually have dialogue day tomorrow, which is um, business leaders. Uh, it is also uh, political leaders and students talking about real issues. And so I've taken leadership role in that. Uh, I've taken leadership role in um, our parent network group. Um, some parents came to me and said we, we need a resource for parents. Uh, this started off as an African American parent network. It changed very quickly into Lance Cruz parents for, uh, for academic support, trying to support parents. Um, our last meeting, we had over 150 people there at the meeting. So um, I'm not leading that group, but I'm helping to uplift that group. It is a parent-run group. It needs to be parent-run, um, but I'm there to support them and get them to the next level. So, Great. Great. Thank you. Trustee Swag. What do you think is the most important educational policy challenge facing districts like ours today? What day is it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we know that. This is never, in the last five years or so, but four, five years ago, we could kind of expect what was going to happen. It's legislatively, we kind of knew we, we had some idea. Now things happen so quickly. Things have happened on the drop of a hat and changed things, so we have to be on it all the time. You know, third grade readings come up again. You know, that's on, uh, on, the, on uh, the docket. Um, the whole best practices, you know, we have to keep the 5% balance, uh, fund balance, which I, I know we're okay with here. Uh, you know, so we need to keep on top of that. Uh, but they constantly are changing. And so to say it's one thing right now, it is one thing. There are a couple things right now. But tomorrow could be something completely different. And the biggest key is to stay connected. And stay connected through, uh, through professional organizations, through the ISD, through our lobbies through the ISD, uh, through superintendent meetings, and then and then there is <clears throat> you know quick communication when something needs to be acted on, we're aware of it and, and we act on it. And then being the superintendent, you know, the superintendent has a lot of power not the right word to use, but they're the ones in the district that can say to teachers, this is what's going on and this is what you need to do about it. We need to start making phone calls. We need to rally the community. We need to, you know, do whatever we need to do to help um, support public education. And it's been a tough road, you know. But, but personally, in, in Lance Cruz, um, with the talk about political politics, <clears throat> Anthony Forlini is our state representative. Um, I, I know him very, very well. As a matter of fact, he helped me hook up with. Um, an Italian partner, so we're starting a partnership with an Italian group to um, have Italian language in our district. They've actually come to us with this partnership, and they're going to be paying for um, two sections of the teacher, one for high, each of our high schools, um, for that. Um, but so I'm connected with with Anthony, um, Ken Goyke, our state senator, and also Lanfear, Jim Townsend. I know him very well. I've been um, to the state capitol. I've, I've lobby for public education uh, in my own uh, precinct and district. Uh, you know, Senator Papa George and, and the people I'm, I'm very active with that too. So, good. What impact do you feel the Michigan Department of Education designation of focus schools is having on Michigan's school districts in general? Well, it's very interesting because <clears throat> anytime you get a label, it looks like it's negative. And focus schools, I know we don't have any focus schools in Oxford, that's great. Um, but people, the general public doesn't understand what it is. You know, they see focus schools and it, it seems like a negative label. However, the, the people who are educated know public education also know that Bloomfield Hills has focus schools and Arbor has focus schools. You know, so there's some very, very good school districts that have focus schools. And it is about the low, lowest 30% and the highest 30% and that discrepancy between the two. Um, a lot of reward schools are really close to being focus schools. And it is because they have jumped. They have made such a gain that as they make their gain, sometimes they spread out 
and to potentially turn into a focus school. Uh, I don't, I'm not a fan of labels. I'm, I'm a fan of improved um, education. We have had focus schools in our district, one and dones. Um, we have some now. Again, we want to be a one and done. Quite frankly, though, some of the things we're doing with the focus schools, it's not bad. You know, what they're requiring us to do is not bad. There's some, there are some good things to it. So uh, I'm not a fan of labels, um, but, but uh, you know, there, there, are, there are some good things going on inside of it. So. Okay. What has been the most unpopular administrative decision you have had to make, and how did you handle the reaction to this decision? Well, um, you can make unpopular decisions, but as long as you're making them within the principles of what you believe in and also the principles of what the school believes in, what, what's our mission statement, what's our vision statement. So I'm going to tell you a story about when I was a high school principal, and, and we had kids who were just not passing classes. They weren't doing well. We're a small district, one high school, and and these kids were just dropping out and not going anywhere. And so, you know, we're, we're about all kids, not just about the best kids, the kids in the middle, you know, not just about, you know, we're about all kids, and even the ones that aren't doing so well. We, you know, they're on a trajectory that we want to help, I want to help. So, so my idea was to start a, an alternative ed you know, program. Well, we had no buildings in our district to do it. So let's do it in our building. And there was a lot of pushback from it. A lot of pushback because the students that we were trying to help, they, they hurt teachers. And I don't mean that physically. They didn't hurt them physically, but they hurt them because they said me things to them. They hurt them because they didn't do their homework. And some teachers take that very personally, which I love. You know, they, they want for the students to do their work. But they did, but these students, you know, if you, again, I'm gonna talk a little, a little bit about research, but you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you, you can't do school if you don't have the base, if you don't feel safe at home, if you're not being fat, if you don't have those basic needs, you, it's a hard time doing school. So, so here we have this group, and we need an alternative program for them. And, and there was a lot of pushback from staff about it. But I did, I do have, I did have um, a decision-making group. It was mostly department heads, but I invited people who wanted to be a part of the group, <coughs> consistently wanted to be a part of the group. And, and I have to tell you, it wasn't a group that was like rubber stamping everything. That, that wasn't this group. There was a lot of pushback. You know, there were some people who, you know, they, were, they just pushed back, which is okay, because that's when you get your best thinking. And then when things come out of that group, you know they're authentic. Staff know they're authentic because they got vetted through this group. So again, through what we believe about what's right for kids, through our principles, through our, our vision and mission, it came to this group that we should start this program, and, and we did. So much to some people's dismay. I'm going to turn it off. Well, that's a whole other story. Oh, that's fine. And I can tell you that if you want me to. Justice Schumann? Thank you. Could you describe your typical style of leading and talk about situations in which you might vary from that style? Very good question. <clears throat> uh, my style of leading is, and I kind of alluded to it, it's very principle based. Be with integrity. I'm going to tell you I'm going to do everything I can do not to break the law. You know, it's it, that's important. You know, I'm talking about for policy, but we in the law, we um, with honesty, with openness, transparency, um, but also collaboratively. You know, so when we're making decisions, as time by decision we're making. We, I feel very strongly that we need to involve the stakeholders who is being affected by this. And so, so that is, that's, that's how I leave. Um, when I had to go against that, 
was, and I can tell you the rest of the story, <laughs> about an alternative ed program. And we did, you know, several years of this program. And again, there were some teachers that were just not in favor of it. And, um, but, but alternative ed kids are a special breed of students, and they are because they, when they turn on, when they, they decide to, you know, graduate, you know, they decide to start doing school, um, it's, it's very interesting. When we first started doing it, I would go up to, to them and, and ask them, what was it? You know, why did you all of a sudden just turn it around? Why, did, why are you making it now? You know, for 17 years you weren't doing it, and all of a sudden now that you're motivated. Every time, it was the same answer. So much so, when, when it happened with another kid, I would first just run up to him. I mean, real soon, run up to him and ask him. And the answer was, I decided. They made a decision to do it. They made a decision to do school. They made a decision to graduate. It wasn't about their girlfriend. It wasn't about their parents. It wasn't about their teacher. I mean, that had something to do with it, but they decided. So coming back to your question now, we have kids now who are on fire, and they are virtual classes, online classes, and they are in, 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 a, in a course of a semester where you're some period of day, they're getting 11 of them done because they're fired up. But now teachers are going, you know, and, and rightfully so because, again, these teachers have been hurt by these kids, and they haven't seen them work, and they've seen them, their work habits, but all of a sudden they're on fire, and there was a lot of skepticism about, is it authentic? You know, are they really doing the work? Is someone else doing it for them? I brought out, you know, you can see when you're doing the online classes when they're doing the work. Some of the times, 2 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock in the morning, they're kind of lying working. And, and they just weren't believing it. And so they just got to a point where we just couldn't have it there anymore. And so before I ended the program, I did reach out to Ray Loke, who had another program so that we could, you know, partner with them and we didn't just lose those kids, we found another spot for them. So. Please describe the strategic planning process you're most comfortable using and share any evidence that you have that the process has been successful. Okay, yeah. So we just went through a strategic planning process last year, and it really started with, there's several different ways to do strategic planning, um, but the process that we went through, uh, we did bring in a consultant. Um, it did start with Bob Maxfield from Oak University. He used to be the superintendent of Farmington, a very well-respected man. He kicked off our, our day on a Saturday. And we invited everybody, we invited teachers, we invited community members, and Kate Cornell was uh, running this along with Suzanne Klein. The, the two of them were our facilitators, and, and they had done this several times before, and, um, and they usually get, you know, 70 or 80 people that come to this, and we had almost 200 people come to the Saturday kickoff thing, which was amazing. And, and we asked, uh, and, and so, Obviously, beforehand, you know, we're kind of all planning this together. Um, but it's, you know, we ask them the questions, you know, what do you want this district to be like? If this could be the best district in the whole world, your utopian district, what would it be like? That was one of the rounds they would do. Another round is, where, where's our shortfalls? What do we need to work on? You know, what, what do we need to do? So there were several different questions that were asked on that particular day. That information was distilled um, by our leadership team, principals, into a vision and mission statement, but then went back to a, a big group of 60 people and brought them in to learn about our district first. You know, we're going back to one of our first things we talked about. You know, who are we? What do we have? What do we offer? How are we doing our test scores? Um, what are we offering in all our buildings? What's happening in our middle school, our elementary schools? Um, learning about the district and then asking the questions again, you know, based on what we know, what are our important things that we need to be looking at? What, what are important, what are we, what's important to you as we're going through this process of learning about the district? And so throughout this process, um, it, was, it was very organic. It was, 
it, it was really kind of neat to see. I, I, I've never been a part of anything like this before where the, um, the, the, um, the goals just kind of evolve in these themes that people were talking about. And there were four goals. <clears throat> um, goals were um, student achievement, student experience, um, finance, and community. And so from this group of 60 people that got together um, to talk, these were the themes. So the goals. And then from those goals, and that was on the curriculum goal and student achievement goal, um, from there, we, we talked about some strategies. You know, what can we do to, to meet this in all the different areas? And we came up with several. And then it was, we got our goals, we got our marching orders, we have some strategies. Which ones do we feel the most important to start with? Because there's a whole bunch, we can't do them all at one time. So which ones are we, do we feel are the most important right now? And that became our, our strategic plan. Yeah, our strategic plan, strategic plan is online. You know, most of it is curriculum based, student experience based. You can see it. But along with that, it's not just the strategic plan, the strategies that are measures of success. How are we going to to show that we're actually achieving what we set out to achieve? Um, and again, that's all online. So, so that happened last year. We are living it right now. Doing a mid-year, we do a mid-year update. And then at the end of the year, uh, you know, final update. So, so anyways, um, and then specifically, you know, the goals range from um, career enhancement. You know, looking at our career paths. And I know you're doing a good job of that here in, in, in Oxford. You know, um, if it's through Project Lead the Way, if it happens to be through, um, you know, the arts or uh, you know, AP classes. Whatever it happens to be, there are different options for students to learn about you know, career paths. So, what are some examples of how you have used data and research to make important decisions in your current position? Okay. Right. So, um, so a bunch. I, I can I said a couple different ways. So, uh, the data and, and the research. Um, data. Um, you know, we look at our scores. And we're looking at our scores and we, you know, specifically looking at science. And science, you know, to work very well in science. Um, and if you look across the state, most of us across the state are doing better well, but it's no wonder. For years and years and years, we've been talking about math and ELA. Math and ELA. We were getting graded on math and ELA, where we spend most of our time. Math and ELA. Now all of a sudden, it is science and social studies. So, so, so looking at the data, obviously, I mean, that's just right there, but other data we're looking at is science, and specifically at the elementary level, is how much time we really spend on science. You know, so, you know, are we spending every day on science at the elementary level? We're not. No, we're not. And so, how much time are we spending, and are we really using that time, or is that time getting eaten up by something else? So. So started looking, as a matter of fact, this year is a science review year in Lance Cruz. We're looking at all, you know, K-12, but specifically at the elementary level, looking at data, our science scores, and how much time we're using on science. So, so then there's a the question about the piece kind of going with that, but that's why we use some data for that. Research. Research, we um, went through a process, I took group through a process a year ago where we had some funds for technology. And, and this is one of the collaborative processes we went through that I was telling you about earlier, kind of leadership side of the hat. We had a pot of money. It wasn't enough to do one on one across the district, uh, but it was a significant amount of money. So. We put everything on the table from iPads to netbooks, Chromebooks, smart boards, all kinds of things, just all, all of it. We went and visited different schools, uh, and basically, long short of it, we landed on smart boards K8 with, with knowing that we had some extra money left over, never had extra money, but we had additional money left over um, for another initiative. So smart boards K8. So those go in during the summertime. And now to the research piece. 
getting them in is easy. Getting teachers to use it is a little more difficult. And so the professional development piece, you know, we know that we have to teach teachers to do this, but there's some clear research about professional development. More of it's at the building level than systems wide, but there's some systems wide research also. And what it says is that reform professional development is better than traditional. However, it's because most reform professional development is longer. It's not a one and done. Traditional is workshops, one and done, one and done, one and done, where this is more sustained. So um, knowing that we have a three-year process for professional developing our, our teaching with smart boards. Um, it's, it's not every professional development, but this year it's in place. It is working. We've had three half days of professional development. We have three full days of professional development. But for the K-8, it's been a half day of smart board training. It has been a different variety of smart board training. First time was an overview. Second time it was um, something that you can do, create a, um, uh, basically it's like a bulletin board where it doesn't matter if you're a high school, middle school person or an elementary person, it, it'll work for you in terms of um, the different tools that are on it. Third time we did it, we, um, we did it by grade level. You know, kindergarten all went to one school, first grade went to another school. At the middle school we did it by math, science, and social studies and English. Um, but, but there's a progression. There is formative assessment. So one of the things we want our teachers to do with kids is we want to know if they, we want teachers to, to make sure they know if the kids know the information. So we have formative assessments that teachers give to their students. We need to do the same thing as administrators. We need to formally assess our staff by surveys, by, by observation, whatever the case is, so that the professional development can be sustained, can stick, and can be effective. So the research behind it is, so, so our plan for professional development, it was research-based. So if you want to too long. So just so we know that we've got about 30 minutes left in this segment, and we have about 14 questions to go through yet. <clears throat> Trustee Blazington? Do you, do you have um, one more question? Oh, I Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, could you please give us some examples of educational change or reform that you've initiated that improved success for all students? Right. Internationally. Oh, yeah. Is that the question I'm sorry? Um, can you give us some examples of educational change or reform that you've initiated that improved success for all students? So, <clears throat> I talked about some of it earlier about the class instruction that works. You know, we know, we know it works if it's done well, if it's done with fidelity and gone through that whole thing. So, um, and I have to tell you that there have been some teachers who haven't really bought into it. You know, there are you know, some people are, I know what to do and I'm a good teacher and I, and I know you are, um, but, but this is something that we are doing. Um, the vast majority have come along with it. Even the ones that are kind of elbowing, you know, they're, they're kind of come along anyways. You know, my whole idea is not to change people's attitudes, but behaviors. So if you become a great teacher, your attitude's going to get to attitude, but we're, we're going to do what's right for kids. So, so that's a systems-wide thing uh, to, to directly impact student achievement. But also on top of that is, like I said earlier, our principals have to be great teachers too. You know, they they have to be great teachers, and so our principals are going through what's called balanced leadership, which is also research-based. It is a McCrell, which is a national international group that does research-based training. They're going through it. I'm going through it too. Uh, you know, we talked about you asked about how to lead, and another thing I didn't say, but I do, is lead by example. You know, I want teachers to go through this class instruction that works. I'm going through it. I want them to talk about it. I'm talking about it with them. I want principals to, to be better teachers. When I'm presenting, I try to do best practices also. I don't want to do sit and get. You know, and, and as administrators, sometimes we're not great teachers. We do sit and get, but we want our teachers to do interactive things, so we have to model that. So 
Thank you. Um, how do you go about evaluating the effectiveness of the curriculum, teaching methods, and assessment used in the district? It, it, it is looking at data. It is looking at, at the numbers. I mean, that's a big piece of it. You know, um, I, I think, so to talk about formative assessment, I think we've nailed it with formative assessment. I think we're like not so good formative assessment. I think on a daily basis, finding out kids know the material, we're pretty good at that. Form of assessing are they learning the curriculum? I'm not sure we're doing a good job of that. I know there's there are products out there, there are um, uh, assessment tools that that can assess, formative assess in a very systematic way, in a um, in a way that you know, there's there's checkpoints along the way that that not only what's happening in the classroom, but is form of assessing the curriculum and. Um, I think we can do a better job of that. Mm -hmm. so. um, you spoke a little bit about launch crews looking at the IB programs. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about what you found with the IB? What so, um, yeah, so, you know, I started my career in Bloomfield Hills, and, and if anybody, I know you know a lot about IB, obviously, but Bill Okma, who was the first principal at the IA, was a social studies teacher with me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I remember Bert getting all excited about this, and Gary Dorr, superintendent, who, um, you know, was a visionary. He, he was a visionary and, and, and started this program. Um, so, so in the ground floor, not that I was not participating in it, so I'm not taking credit for that, because that wasn't me, but very familiar with it because <clears throat> in the district, I work with teachers, um, and now in Lance Cruz, we have been investigating, I have been meeting with um, people from um, from Bloomfield. I have a meeting with Sue Meyer, who is the ISD coordinator for, um, for um, the IB program. Eric Stern is the principal over at the IAM. Um, you know, so I've been having conversations with him, learning a lot about it, you know, um, how we started up. And for us, there's two ways to start it up. Start up the way you started up, you know, uh, getting authorized, application, application fee, authorized, the whole process. But there's another way that we can go with the high school level, with the diploma program, the DP program, and the MYP program, because they have that at the ISD also, is to partner with the ISD, kind of like Bloomfield did with Troy and Garon Valley. So, um, so we're looking at different ways to get that to go. Uh, we, we haven't landed on it yet. We haven't landed on if it's going to be PYP program, the prime years program, middle years program, some of each, none of each, so, you know, but. But I do know a lot about it. I, I do know um, the amount of training that goes into it. There's an extensive amount of training. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of it uh, from the elementary level, especially the elementary level, also at the high school level, all the way through. Um, so I, I have a lot of experience with it and know quite a bit about it. Good. Thank you. Can you elaborate just a little bit more about the global education initiatives and programs you mentioned that the Italian relationship you had? Right, so, um, so we do have that, we're going to start this next year, uh, but we also have a Chinese program. And it's, it's very similar to what you have here. We are probably a year behind you, maybe a year and a half, but we just had a board workshop yesterday where we talked about the Chinese dorm. Uh, we have 13 students right now um, that are on I-9s. Um, we hold the I-9s just like you hold I-9s here. Uh, we have relationships with several different schools in China. We don't want it to be as China. We're branching out with Italians. We, we'd like to, you know, grow this to make it a truly international program, not just one country. Uh, we're working on it. Uh, our building utilization team, and we have another 60 people we've been working with since September, and a lot of them were at the board meeting yesterday, the board workshop last night. Uh, th this is one of our initiatives. I mean, very similar to what's going on here. We, we know that there's many benefits that can that students can experience, our students, their, their students, that they can be experienced in this partnership. Um, we, we also know there's a, a financial benefit, you know, and the state isn't helping us, not with this Chinese program mm -hmm. or the international program, but the state's not helping us with funding. Uh, our best practice dollars, are going to be constantly, you know, I mean, they are disappearing. So we have to take control ourselves. We also have to take care of our own community. You know, so there's a balance. 
there's a balance, and there's got to be a balance. There always has to be a balance. But but our international program is very similar to your program. Um, our partners in Nantong, uh, which is just outside of Shanghai. I have been to China. When I was in Lamp here, we started a kindergarten immersion program, preschool immersion program. It's now through fifth grade. Uh, in this cruise, we have a kindergarten immersion program. It's going to be kindergarten first next year. Uh, but, but very familiar with what you're doing because we're doing a lot of the same things for a lot of the same reasons. So. Thank you. Ms. President Mitchell? Yes. Describe your experience with budget development and financial management. Okay. A lot of experience with that. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a CFO in our district. Uh, we also have our, our core cabinet team is, is the CFO. It's myself. It's the superintendent. It's, it's HR. And, and everything comes right through, through us, um, through that. So it doesn't work in our district as a sole entity because we're all responsible for everything. So with, with the Italian program now, for example, um, I put together a performa for that. You know, even though we're getting this donation and it's gonna cover almost all the teacher, you know, for those two hours, this is this is what's gonna cost, how it's gonna be. You know, so everything that's coming out, every new program that we're starting, uh, we're doing a cost analysis on it. We're looking at, and, and again, for the IB, uh, again, for uh, Project Lead the Way. But we work very closely with, uh, with Rochelle, our, our CFO. Uh, we, we're, we're going through budget cuts. I mean, we're in a deficit right now. Uh, we're operating in deficit. Fortunately, we have a, a, a healthy fund equity. It's not going to last forever. But, um, you know, last year we cut over $1.5 million, which sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, uh, but in a $110 billion budget, it's, it's, a little, it's a little bit. So we are. So I'm a piece of that. I'm uh, very active in what we are going to shave without hitting instruction. As a matter of fact, we've been very fortunate. Now that we've cut budget, but we've also grown programs. We started an Air Force uh, Junior ROTC program last year, which is not cheap to start. So it's, it's not cheap to start. Um, increased our APs, our AP courses. Uh, we, you know, we, we've grown a Chinese program. We've done a lot of different things, and at the same time, you know, had to make some tough bunch of cuts at the same time too. So um, I, I'm not in the business office. I'm not doing their job. But, um, but I am involved on a, on a regular basis with um, the CFO, with our, our cabinet team. Uh, we have a finance meeting once a month for Board of Education that I'm a part of um, every month. And um, so I have quite a bit of experience with that. Okay. Thank you. In tough financial times, how do you set priorities where there are competing interests, such as the need to implement programs for struggling students and also keep programs for gifted students. Mm -hmm. and, and we do. You know, we have to keep them both. You know, for, for every program, one way or the other, we, we have to meet the needs of all our students. We just do. We have to, um, and we have to prioritize. Um, one thing that we have to avoid at all costs is we have to avoid cutting programs. Because as small as a program might be, take the smallest program you have that, that affect the least amount of kids, that opportunity is not going to be there anymore. So potentially, we're going to lose those kids to someone else who has that program. And then, and then what? And now we're down more kids. And so we have to look to cut another program. And before you know it, you have an outward cycle. So protecting programs is very important. And, and so we have to do, we have to look at other ways to, to, to cut, to be more frugal. Um, in, in Lance Cruz, for example, we, um, we've kept buses for 10 years before replacing and now we're in a 12-year cycle. You know, so we have to stretch our dollars. Our, our computers, I'm in charge of technology also. Um, instructional technology, infrastructure technology. And 
our workstations, we're on a five-year cycle, and we're in a six-year cycle. So it, it is, it's a lot of little things, it's a lot of big things, but, but really getting creative and looking around to where can we make it happen so that we can provide programs for our highest flyers and the students that need the help the most. Um, so. Okay. What ideas might you explore to raise money for the district? Have you had success in procuring additional funds for your current district? I have. I have. Um, one example is <clears throat> um, we have an alternative at building and we do, do too. I um, have great relationships with uh, other superintendents. I'm well connected with the ISD um, through um, uh, curriculum directors. Um, so we have a good relationships throughout, throughout the county. And um, there's a neighboring district, a couple districts over, that, um, that, that was kind of like the land field that I was in, doesn't, didn't have uh, an alternative ed program. And it wasn't that we were just taking where we were going to send us. We, we negotiated with them, and we wanted to help them. They want to help their kids, but we also want them to be successful. So, so we put together a plan in terms of where you're at, and you're staying at your high school, where you're at, you're on the bubble, and where you're at, you need to come to us. And then how do you get back? You know, it's not only about coming here, but how do you get back? That plan to get back. So long and short of it, we, we did, um, I did, um, with Kerry Wozniak and Dave Richards, the superintendent from Frazier, negotiated a contract for them to send students to us. And, um, and, and we did procure a bus between the two of us. Um, we do get the full foundation allowance, um, half of the bus we pay for, and then they, they have their students who are, are graduating or on that tra trajectory. You know, and so anyways, that's, that's one way that um, you know, we're looking to, to procure uh, additional funds. Okay. Describe the extent of your experience in managing facilities and district operations. Okay, I have a lot of experience with that too. As a matter of fact, um, our, um, one of my uh, former colleagues who ran that department went to a different district, and um, his wife actually teaches in the district here. Uh, but I worked very closely with, uh, with, with, this was Bob Kelly, and now uh, Bob Prill, uh, who is our facilities manager, uh, not in Lance Cruz, but when I was a high school principal. In a small, small district, you do everything. You know, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in charge of finding a preschool in the, in the, in the district. Where is the preschool class going to go? Um, but now in Lance Cruz also, um, the, built the um, facilities does come through our CFO. Um, however, again, everything comes through the cabinet. And we have a building and site meeting once a month with our Board of Education. And, um, and I'm a part of that. However, I'm not part of that tonight because it's going on right now. <laughs> Okay. What has been your experience in dealing with schools of choice programs? What do you see as the advantages and the disadvantages of such programs? Well, first of all, I, I think our state's broken as far as that goes. I think that <coughs> statewide, it's it's a disaster. I think that um, you know we're all competing because we have to compete. You know, the state put us in this situation; we have to compete. We don't have a choice. We have to compete with it. But it basically comes down to parents who are driven, who want to help their kids, and either have the means to do it or have the, 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 the grit to get it done for their kid. There's been a lot of controversy in our district about school of choice. It has, I mean, through our strategic planning process and through our building utilization process, it has been covered that our school of choice kids are doing as well as our kids that are here, you know, that are home, home kids. Um, it's been discovered that a lot of our school choice parents are presidents of the PTO, band boosters presidents, very involved in the community, very involved in, in the schools. Um, so overall, I, I wish they would just abolish the whole thing because it only, in my opinion, it's only going to help kids that really have parents who can get them to where it needs to be. But it's a reality we have it. and. You know, fortunately here in Oxford, we have things that attract students, um, programs for everybody, and it's, and it's a necessary, and 
we need to take advantage of that when we can take advantage of it. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Abolish the ability to have service work? I, I, so I think that the state's put us in a, in a very difficult position where where we have to come from other districts. We have to try to get our next door neighbor's kids. We have to try to get you know kids from other districts, and they're trying to get our kids. And, and so I, I just think we need to go away. Because I think they need to take care of the kids that live right here. I think they need to fund us properly, take care of our kids right here, service our kids that we need to, um, they are ours, and, and that's it, you know, so. I, I've got plans for changing the world. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Dan. How would you hold individual school sites and central office staff accountable for results while improving district morale at the same time? So, um, I think part of that, so um, holding people accountable we have to hold each other accountable. It's, it's not an option anymore. You know, we're getting, uh, we're being graded on our, our, our test scores. Uh, we are being judged by how we're doing, how we're performing. Uh, however, our teachers are doing this already, our administrators are doing this already. I mean, they, they are doing formative assessments. They are doing, uh, using data. We need to do it better. I think we need to do a better job of it. Um, but it's no secret what we have to do. Uh, teachers want to do a good job. Teachers want their kids to succeed. Building principals want their teachers to do well. Building principals want their teachers to succeed. So it's about putting systems in place. And, and I'm a huge fan of systems because when you have systems in place, you can, you can get things done, you can get it done more effectively, and you can sustain it. So when things are in place, when there's systems in place, it, it, it benefits us on several different, uh, on, on several different uh, uh, facets. And so, so now keeping, so the second part was uh, keeping morale, you know. So part of this is knowing you're doing a good job. Part of this is just acknowledging that we're working hard. Um, I had a teacher in our district um, great teacher. This teacher is a general ed teacher, third grade teacher. Got an award at the ISD. First time a general ed teacher got an award for a special ed student. Your special ed awards. Amazing teacher. I'm in their class one day. I'm in the building, and like I said before, you know, at the beginning, they're not sure what I'm doing there. Now I, I can walk around the building myself and walk in the classroom, and it's, it's just like what happens. And this teacher just said, I am so overwhelmed right now. Amazing teacher. Can we not do the smart board training next week, Wednesday? I need this time for this and that. Overwhelmed. Um, and, and we had several email conversations after this. And, 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 and teachers are overwhelmed, but they want to do a good job. So bottom line is, is we have a plan for smart board training. Do we need to take care of this teacher too? We do. We, we need more time. You know, that's one of the things that we're missing in education is, 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 is professional development time. Teachers want time to do a good job. They need time to do a good job. So acknowledging, going back to the whole thing, is, is acknowledging they're working hard, acknowledging they're doing a good job, and then, you know, having the data supported too. So. How would the president of various unions in your district describe you? Um, I've got a, a, a very uh, good relationship with our union uh, president. Uh, we meet on a regular basis. Uh, I meet with her with my curriculum managers on a regular basis, monthly basis, and with human resources on a monthly basis. So our, our assistant superintendent for HR, when they're meeting, I'm a part of that. Uh, when it's curriculum right, I'm a part of that too. Um, and then also ad hoc meetings, I was at a we had our work workshop last night, and there was a question about, you know, a teacher doing some extra work, and so it's like, that's what's going on with this? And I said, well, this, this is what I understand it to be. We don't require to be there. It's a, it's a, it's a volunteer thing. So, you know, I think it's required to be there. Well, let's talk about it. I don't think it is. Find out. Let me know. You know, so it's, it's open. It's honest. It's right there. Um, uh, um, 
my former district, uh, very good relationship with them too. Um, I had a letter in, um, in my packet from my former uh, union president there. Um, so, you know, again, going back to how to lead with integrity, with honesty, open and transparent, it, it's, that's the way you gotta be. That's the way I have to be. What is your philosophy regarding professional development for teachers and principals? What role should professional learning communities play, if any? So I talk, talk a lot about you know professional development, not so much about professional learning communities, but but that's where the power is. So you know teachers. So I'm I'm a huge fan of professional development. Uh, professional development, obviously too, but uh, professional learning communities, and and there's explicit knowledge. It's knowledge that we own and we can attain. We can learn it. But there's also this this, this, um, this implicit knowledge. Anyways, um, it's this it's this knowledge that you, you just get because you get good at it. And, 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 you, and it gets passed along because you're hanging out with somebody who has that. And so so the, the explicit, that you can learn from somebody else, the, uh, I said implicit, I'm not sure that's right, I, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought here, but it's, it's, the, it's the knowledge that is just inside you. And when you are working in professional learning communities, that information gets shared because they can see it, you're having conversations with it, and it's leading to growth. Now on top of that, you're still talking about good instruction. You're still talking about data. You're still talking about what works for the kid. I can't go through this kid. What are you doing with this you know, that kid? Some of that. There's a lot of great conversation going on with that. So it's a, it's about it's about teacher growth. It's about student growth. It's about having conversation about good teaching. It's about having conversation about data. So and, and again, I think you want need more time to do it. Uh, question for me: in, in your current position. How much time do you spend in the schools, in classrooms, and in the community? Uh, what value has that been to you? So I, I talked a lot about that before. <coughs> I have um, Wednesday mornings are my time to get in the buildings. And so I, I have my, my secretaries block that off. And so, you know, my day is here to here. And just because I have Wednesday morning doesn't mean that my day ends. It just means it just keeps going on. Um, and I have to be honest with you. I, I don't get in every Wednesday. Emergency pop up, um, things happen. Uh, I was actually at a conference yesterday, uh, but, but Wednesdays are my days that I'm in buildings. But then also we'll have uh, a middle school principal meeting at this building, so I'll come in that building, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk around. Uh, and I'll hit another building on the way back home too. Back, back home, yeah, it feels like my home, but back to my office. Um, so, um, it, it is a great benefit. Um, I was at one of the middle schools last week in a teacher's classroom, you know, and and, and she was doing a smart board demonstration, and um, you know, so she asked me a question. You know, my kids want to get a smart notebook. You know, we need a, we need a, um, a, a lab set of smart notebook. I'm like, huh? Oh, I know we've talked about that. We only have so many licenses, you know. We, you know, for each of the teachers and some that. So I go back and. I talked to the tech director, he's like, every lab has it. Every, we have a lab in every building. And at least one of the labs has that. So back to the teacher, guess what? We have it, okay, here we go. So so there are, I am seeing kind of teaching going on, but there's conversation happening too. And so part of the professional development is what they have to do, but it's a part of, again, acknowledging it, being there, having conversations, supporting them. Um, teachers like the administrators are around. I mean, they, they just do. So um, it's, it's good for me because I get to get in the classrooms. I get to see what the boots on the ground people are doing. I get to spend time with kids. Um, my day goes a little longer, but that's okay. You know, that's this is the reason why we're here. We're here for the kids. We're here for instruction. We're here for making teachers better teachers. And so those conversations are great. Yeah. That's it from us. So now we've got some questions. Those were the easy questions. Now we have the tough ones from the community. So.
here. We got, I've got them right here, so I'll read some of them to you. Uh, what types of supports and interventions would you propose for at-risk and special needs students at each of the levels, elementary, high school? Right, and that's it's it's real. It's a real um, issue where we have our students that are struggling, and so what do we do? And there are several different things we can do. Uh, there are some things that we can do in, in, in a small pocket and then a big pocket too. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what kind of $31 you get in our district, but there's there is some money for at-risk students uh, to use for that. Uh, but specifically, excuse me, um, there are a lot of things that we can do with kids uh, that are at risk, and part of it is is knowing who they are. Part of it is uh, paying attention to they are. In our district, um, we have we're, we're, we're committed to literacy at the elementary level. You know, I, I really believe if kids can come out of elementary school reading, they have success for the rest of their life. You know, so so when they're coming out of fifth grade, you know, the, the state's saying they need to be at 85% by 2023, whatever it happens to be, I want a 100% right now. And we're not there yet. We're at, we're at about 80%, just under 80%, but, but that's the focus. And in our, um, our elementaries, we have what's called um, uh, Daily Five for Literacy. And the Daily Five, it's a 90-minute, it's part of a 90-minute block, literacy block, and then our Daily Five, and this is really student-driven, and when you're doing things that are student-driven, there's much more engagement. When it's teacher-driven, there's, there's less student engagement. So it is, it is reading to self. It is reading to others. It is listening to reading. It was, it's working on writing. It's, it's work work. And so when we're doing the Daily Five, they're in groups, but now teachers can get to kids who are at risk, who are in need of, in need of extra uh, attention, and can and know them because of assessments they're doing. They have to be a finance and Pinnell. It happens to be a, a qualitative uh, reading inventory. Uh, but what, what they have, um, and now they can work with their kids on an individual basis. We have what's called a, um, the needs assessment in our district, and it's, it's very specific to Lance Cruz. It's, a, uh, it's, it's been written right just for us, and basically at a teacher's fingertips, they have everybody in their classroom and how they're doing on all their assessments. So we have that information, we have that at the middle school level too. So it does get a little more tricky at the middle school level uh, because we don't have the kids um, all day long. They do go from class to class. Um, but, but we do have um, interventionists who uh, will either pull kids out, uh, get teacher strategies. Uh, and and what's, what's not happening is people aren't giving up. You know, they know that there are real issues, but nobody's giving up. Uh, we're, we're here, and we're continuing to do a better job um, because the data is transparent, because the, you know, um, it, it, it's available to anybody. Um, we, we, we've been doing a better job than we have in the past. Um, high school level, you know, that gets um, even, even tougher. Uh, because now you're talking about tracking in some instances. Uh, but again, it, it is about, uh, with our, our struggling, I have to tell you, you know, at, at the high school level, math specific, I'm a math guy, um, we've tried algebra two over two years with our juniors and seniors, and it's not working very well. And we're, we're talking about going back to, we're looking at power standards and give them, give them to them in a, in a year in a different way because more math over a long period of time just isn't doing it for them. So, um, so some things are working, um, some things aren't working, but we're not afraid to look at that and say, you know, we can make a change. Thank you. Uh, what role does the superintendent have in ensuring that the district hires the best and brightest as employees? So, um, I, I think there's definitely a, a, a piece that the superintendent plays in that, and part of it is, is um, again, putting systems in place so that we have a vetting process at the, um, 
at the interview level that we're getting the best candidates, that um, we have the right people on the committees, and I know we're probably talking about teachers at this point, uh, that we have a process to really um, you know, view the teacher to see if they are really, can, can they do it? You know, do we have a system set up where they're doing a lesson? Because uh, a lot of times we hire teachers and we've never seen them teach. You know, so, so we need to have a system in place and it has to go through a process. And yes, I'd like to be a part of that. I don't want to know that we're hiring the absolute best teachers we can possibly find. Yeah, so. Thank you. Tell us about the student that you have impacted the most in your career. Well, I think there's been a, a lot of them. And um, there's been some that have been high flyers that have just, you know, used lift them up to that next level and then there's been kids who you know I can tell you about you know 13 different alternative ed kids that you know it, it, it's about the relationship you know it's having a relationship with them and then when that light turns out when they they do spin it around you know again acknowledging them but um, yeah I'm a Facebook guy I'm a Facebook guy I've got Facebook and um, I do keep in touch with former students and average students that were alive during, during the year. Um, but, uh, but, I mean, you know, some of, some of my best friends right now are students I had back in the 80s and 90s. So, to pick one, um, I can pick, like, I don't have to pick a lot. So, and, and, and some of those some of those students are my own kids. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, describe specific programs, policies, or other items you consider to be your greatest contributions in the schools or districts that you have worked, and would you like to implement or develop any of those at Oxford? Okay. So you know, early on, um, as a high school principal. The ACT came, and people were just totally freaking out about it. I can't believe everybody's going to take the ACT. Well, we're over that now because everybody's taking it. But when it first came in, it was, you know, it was, oh, I don't know what we're going to do. So um, what I, through this team again, this decision-making team, we had some time during the day on a regular basis that um, called reading time that I really wanted to use for ACT prep. You know, and we were starting with reading, ACT reading prep. And oh my gosh, you know, math teachers teach them reading, and, and social studies teachers reading is a little bit you know, better stretched, but PE teachers and our teachers teaching reading was, it was, you know, it was not, it was not something that was very popular. But again, through this, this process, um, it was the PE teacher that said, I think we need to do this every week. You know, and I was like, let me hug you. <laughs> But, but so, and so we did do that, and it did grow from reading to math to science. It did grow, and it was very successful. Um, it has grown um, in Las Cruz. We now have, uh, we call it something different. We call it college, college prep, college experience. It has that ACT prep piece in it. Well, obviously, that's changing now into the SAT. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I'll talk about politics a little more. Uh, and then on top of that, now we see, we're changing the, AC, uh, the SAT. The SAT is changing too. So, you know, so do we need that here? I, I, I think we do. I think we need some prop. Part of getting kids ready for the testing is the knowledge. We, they have to know the content. But what they also have to know are what is the test like. If you don't have that ability, you don't have that experience, you don't have that knowledge, it might say, um, please infer what you know from the reading. Well, if a kid doesn't understand what the word infer means, what the question stem is, they don't have a chance. You know, and so we're talking about using the same language that is on the assessment that we're using in class. You know, so we may have a cutesy word for, you know, bubbling in the bubble, you know, but when we, when we, um, when we get to this, um, the M step, there should be specific, we just got more test questions yesterday, on what to do, and when you use that language that they're using on the test in our classrooms. So, sorry about the long response, but I, I think um, test prep is not a bad thing. That's good. That's good. How would you ensure vertical alignment from early childhood programs to elementary, then elementary to middle, 
and then high school. Yeah. And so that's about systems also. You know, and that's a very difficult thing to do because um, a lot of times we, we don't have time, again, for elementary to talk to middle, for middle to talk to high school. Um, but we have to, and in, in my district now, you know, I'm, I meet regularly with the elementary principals, regularly with the middle school principals, regularly with the high school principals. And so a couple of those meetings a year are elementary and middle school principals, are middle school and high school principals because that has to start with leadership. We, we, we just can't leave it to the teachers. They have too many things to do. We have to put a system in place to ensure that happens. So it is about putting systems in place. It's about being purposeful. It's about having conversations. So. Last one, and then you can ask us some questions or have some final comments. Would you continue school of choice here, given your views? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a fan of it, but we you know, our, the state of Michigan has put us in a, a pretty bad situation where, you know, we get, we get funding based on how many kids show up at our door. And so if we have great programs, why shouldn't all kids benefit from it? You know, if they're in our district or not for our district. And again, from what I found out um, through, through research from seeing um, is that the parents that bring the kids, most of them, most of them are motivated to have the kids have a better education. They're motivated to get their kids here. Um, so, so I'm, I'm okay with it. Thank you. Okay, it's your turn. Um, I do have a couple questions. Um, I know there were some focus groups that happened um, throughout the district. And, um, you know, so what, what did you get from the focus group that would help me be a better superintendent in Oxford? Anyone want to tackle that one? I have the focus yeah. questions here, too. Go ahead. Can you do one? I actually looked at all of the responses that were correlated for us. And I kind of counted the number of times certain themes or topics mm -hmm. came up. And I noticed communication. Um, evaluating programs and um, infrastructure. Interesting. Uh, evaluating programs, I think, is very important because we do a very good job of giving teachers and administrators more things to do, but not a very good job of taking things off people people's plates. And, and we have to be very purposeful with that too, because teachers do a good job. They do a good job of what they're doing in the classrooms. But there might be something that they're doing that we don't need them to do anymore. And so we need to be purposeful in helping them with that. So, what else? You're asking us. Oh, I mean, what else from the, the focus group? Is that it? Um, people spoke about continuing our current momentum. Okay. You know, don't change the course. A lot about building trust okay. between different stakeholders. Um, a lot about just need for transparency and openness okay. from our central office all the way down. Um, someone who can develop and implement a plan to sustain the programs we offer. Looking for a proven track record, especially with the academic needs of the district. So the Dr. Wall did a great job on mm -hmm. summarizing the different Good. stakeholder groups. Well, I have to tell you that, you know, first of all, looking at Oxford from the outside in, and I'm, I'm looking at the, the website, all the offerings, just as an outside. I don't feel like an outsider. I feel like I know Oxford very well. But if you look at it from an outside view, it's like, wow. I mean, we've got it going here. Mm -hmm. We have it going. We've got great programs, and we need to make it happen. Keep happening. Keep happening deeper stronger and better and that's that's what i would bring to you um, i would bring to you um, that um, and, and, a, and, a, and a commitment to you know continue to grow and improve so um so another question i have is i know um, that there are questions out there for community members maybe parents and also students about um, strategic planning. Um, so what is the process for developing your strategic plan and then, you know, would I be a part of that? 
Yes, you would definitely. You would definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And it's just starting right now, and we're in the initial phase of it, and there's been some things discussed about it, and some of them are, instead of just having a, a, a six-month review or whatever to keep that time frame, make it uh, quarterly or even more often to see how the things are being implemented timely and, and that different type of process this time. But. So it's starting now, but it's some, so it's not like there's, it's not formed. Okay, or it's formed. Got it out. But they actually have done surveys last year of the, the staff, the parents, the students. So some things have been done prior to, to get ready for it. So you, you brought up a very good point, I think, for that. Um, so one thing I'm doing with my strategic plan right now is what you were just talking about. And last month, we got the strategic planning team together again and did our mid-year update with them specifically. And here's where we're at. This is what we are, we are charged to do. Here's where we're at. And, and here's what we're going and getting feedback from them. So what we're doing right now is exactly what you're describing. And, and, uh, and I'm um, used to. And, so thank you. Um, I know that we have some new members on the board. I know that there's been a commitment to education on the board in terms of you being educated as, as board members. And it's, it's a great role model you know, for, for administrators, for teachers that, that you're members to. Is with the new board members, is that commitment going to continue? Well, I got, when I found out that uh, I made it to the board, um, I got an email the next morning from my administrator congratulating me and said, oh, by the way, the Michigan Association of School Board Members have their annual, conf annual conference tomorrow. Do you want to go? I jumped in the car. Way to go. Way to go. And so it was as many classes as I possibly could. Great. One of the first meetings we had was the board workshop with the MASB 101. Okay. So even though some of us had taken it, we sat together and took it as a, as a board. Multiple very, times. Very good. Multiple <laughs> times. Very really good. So yes. Fantastic. And we're looking at this opportunity of a new superintendent coming in to uh, bring the group together as a team of eight and uh, work with that person in terms of uh, building relationships with the board and the superintendent and how that will uh, move out into the community in terms of some of the things you've mentioned about being transparent and open and getting community involvement and continuing to improve on that and uh, look to how we can uh, take those ideas and then incorporate them into our strategic plan and keep on moving it such that we may want to adjust the strategic plan in two or three months with a new opportunity that presents itself that we become aware of. Right. Or if something changes that we thought was going to be a constant or a program or a system, we want to be able to adjust and react to that so that we're more proactive than reactive. Very good. Yeah. Even though Mike and Mike and I are new to this new to board, mm -hmm. Mike and I have worked for Oxford schools for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And Mark yeah. is in charge of like our um, athletic boosters president. So so the three of us, even though we're new to the board, we're very involved in the community. Fantastic. That's great. Through the board or the community. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, one of the, the big things that be good for you to know and everyone that's here is the board itself has made a commitment to healing and that's not everything funnels down through the system from from the top of the system that's so true we're looking to see a lot of progress just in general in the district. so uh, thank you for that so from the people i've talked to uh, in the district outside the district it seems like there, there's a need that there is a want um, for for reaction, for for some healing, for um, for some visibility, uh, for for some deep implementation. Uh, one of the things I know that Oxford is lacking is is a relationship with the ISD um, in terms of administration and ISD. Um, and, and that's from talking with superintendents, from talking to people at the local schools. And that, going back to the question about, you know, what do we do for our struggling learners? What do we do for student achievement? 
they're a great resource for us. You know, they are people that are doing research, that are looking at the best practices so that we don't have to do as much the, 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 the hard work. And we're still doing hard work. Everybody's doing hard work. But to partner with them and to mend that relationship and to grow that relationship so they can benefit us. It's, it's only to benefit us. So, so I've noticed that through the, so the, through the research that I've done um, you know, in the district and outside the district. Too. So. Well, I'd say uh, um, I, I, I can't tell how much I appreciate you asking me to be here today. Um, Good to have you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I feel like I'm a very good fit for your district. I, they, I bring things that are very unique from my K-12 experience to um, the, the way that I lead, um, the way I interact with people, um, my knowledge of curriculum, um, of the international program, of, of collaboration, of, 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 of Project Lead the Way. The people I've talked to in the district, you know, they had said that we really try to find the right fit for all of our kids. And I pushed them on it. I said, now is this, is this you telling me that? That's what you do? Or is that for the district? And, and it was resounding that that's what the district tries to do is to give the, the, the best opportunity for the student. High school level, there's all kinds of ways to go. Are you an art person? Are you an engineer? Are you uh, more musical? You know, where, where are you at? And, and what I'm hearing and I'm believing is that we're really trying to find the best place for all of our kids. That, that's, that's who I am. I mean, I, you know, setting the focus, setting, uh, you know, our kids come first, and then staying true to it. We've got, we've got great programs here. Uh, can, can some more systems be put in place to um, optimize? Yeah, I'm sure there are. Uh, but, you know, take more of that, sustain more of that, but improving more of that too. And, and I think I can bring that to the district. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to take a short break. I really thank you for coming and appreciate your time. We'll take about a five minute and then we're going to discuss how we're moving forward. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is too about how I understand this should work and if you have something to add. We have a choice tonight. We've scheduled uh, second round interviews for Monday to begin. We have a choice of narrowing it down from the three candidates to two candidates. We have the choice of choosing one candidate if there's a consensus and make a decision tonight. If anyone thought that way, I would suggest that we take a 20 minute break or half hour break because I've looked through the other candidates information that they provided that wasn't in the packet but we just got um, Ed's information so I would want to take time to look through that if we thought that's what we needed to do. Um, I guess I could just, do you have anything that you'd like to well, say I, to I that? Think, or? Yeah, I mean I think you have three choices. Um, move forward with all three, move forward with two, move forward with one. It's your prerogative, whichever direction you go. We do have tentatively um, a, a second interview and a day in the district scheduled for Monday. Mm -hmm. But frankly, with a snow day today and a snow day tomorrow, um, a weather day, I, I don't see how you can possibly do that day on Monday. So I would suggest that perhaps we look at maybe doing it Wednesday and Thursday, if that works for the board. Um, I just don't think, I mean, I think you can do the interview with the board without any trouble. I just don't know how you arrange for stakeholders when there's nobody in the district to be able to make those connections. Correct. Is there also a chance to get audience feedback? 
and thoughts during the process to read this open meeting? <coughs> what you said you want to go? I would, um, I would be comfortable narrowing to two, um, mainly because I'd like to take some time to digest things, and I would like to give this the opportunity to kind of look at other things. Um, I, I, do, I like that overnight thinking, get up fresh the next day, and take up um, step back a little bit. That's my personal opinion. What does anyone else think about? I'm comfortable at least narrowing the pool demo. I think from comments I heard last night, I, I think I have an understanding of who the two may be, but um, mm -hmm. we'll have to have a motion, I, I imagine, to that effect. Uh, I would, if you want to narrow it, I would just suggest you let me help you do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important that we do it in a manner that is going to preserve the integrity of the person that is not moving forward. Correct. Uh, we can do that fairly quickly, but we can do it without... Um, Trevor wrote the paper that it was 4-3 to take so-and-so or whatever. <laughs> okay, well then, then why don't you initiate why don't you take us through that? Sure. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put on the board the last names of the three people that you interviewed in the sequence in which you interviewed them. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to take a name off the board as opposed to put names in the pool. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to pull each one of you individually and ask you if you want to continue to pursue Mr. Palmer. If, if I started with Joyce, for example, and you told me no, I would go on to Mark and to Dan and so on until all seven of you told me no, I would take that name off and you're down to two. If one person tells me yes, I'm going to leave that name on the board and stop right there and go to the next person down the list. So seven no's will take a name off the list, one yes will leave a name on the list, and when we get to that point where we still have uh, potentially three names on the list, then you're going to have to have some discussion amongst each other as to which name you think should come off and why, uh, or which one should stay and why. Okay? Understand what we're going to do? Understand. So, Mr. Shoemaker, I'm going to start with you, if that's okay. Do you wish to continue to pursue Mr. Palmer as a candidate for the position of superintendent? I do not. Thank you. Mr. Sway? No. Mr. No. Reese? Ms. Mitchell? No. Mr. D'Alessandro? No. Mr. Stepick? No. Mr. Prezi? No. Easy as that. So, you have two candidates left. And what I would, again, suggest we do is look at changing the schedule for next week a little bit and move Monday to Wednesday, that would give us time to arrange for stakeholders to adjust their schedules as they need to be able to meet with them. At this point, with the district being closed, it's almost impossible to arrange a day similar to the day that I spent in the district uh, talking with stakeholders. I, I've indicated to those people that they would have an opportunity to meet small groups with each of the final candidates, have those candidates explain to them why they think they're uniquely qualified to be your district's next superintendent, and a chance to ask some specific questions. In the back of tab four, the last page in tab four, is a comment sheet. And uh, what I would want to do is provide those comment sheets to every person who comes in contact with these two final candidates and ask them to complete that sheet individually, not collectively. Get them to pat ball here. We'll get them duplicated for each member of the board so each of you will be able to see all of the comments that are made from people as they have met with these two final candidates. So that's how you get that, that direct information from them. And then after they do a full day in the district, they'll do another hour-long interview with the board. Um, I need some help from you in formatting that interview for you. Under tab six in your binder, there's some questions that you could draw from. But I'd like to suggest that each member of the board choose one question from that pre-can list and write me two that you're interested in of your own hearing more about each of these two individual candidates. If you will email me those, I'll sort them, put them together for you so that when you're ready for your interview with the first candidate on Wednesday, you have a complete time like you have the last two months. 
Okay, so you follow what I'm asking you to do? Draw one question from that list. And again, if multiple people choose the same question, I'll, I'll look at them and just kind of broker them from there. Uh, and you're going to draft two questions that still remain in your mind about Mr. Throne and two questions from Mr. Okanowski. You send those to me, I'll combine them into one list for the entire group, and then we'll have the list of questions for that second interview. You said that the community, when you open it up, and the community, like you had the forum, will be yep. able to give input also, yep. correct? Yep, and, and that, they're going to do that individually. Um, and they're going to give you an individual sheet. Well, we don't want group thought in this. We want individual thought. And, and if you look at that sheet, you'll see it asks you what assets do you see this, this candidate bringing to Oxford and what concerns continue to remain for you. Um, what kinds of things would you like the board to know as they look at these two candidates? Are we looking just at input of people who were here both nights? No. Um, we're looking at people who choose to come to those um, those same forum groups that I met with. For example, I met with uh, support staff here at central office. I met with union presidents. I met with kids at the high school. I met with building administrators. I met with superintendents' cabinet. I met with uh, people of the community at large. We want to schedule those same stakeholders, uh, identify a specific time for them, and let them come in a small group and have a discussion with these two candidates, just as I had with them a week or so ago. Do you think that some groups may take longer than just the 30-minute time allotment that you allowed before? Like, I'm thinking that I would like you to go visit the high school and meet with high school teachers. Yeah, I, I would go say to the to middle you, school. I would just say to you that's a disaster, and I, would I don't not want do a that. disaster. So. <laughs> I, I would not do that. Okay. Um, because then, then what you get is um, people walking down the hall. And it's a quick impression. And, and if if I walk by the secretary and go to the building principal, then the secretary's ticked and she's writing negative comments. It's much better to have representative groups. And let That's what I meant. If that representative group would that be at the, like, would you be able to go to the buildings to get uh, a representative group? We would to go to meet with the high school kids. That's what I did. That's right. But okay. it makes for a difficult day. Um, if you're running all over the district, you lose too much time. So it's much easier to have a candidate in one place and have people come here okay. instead of the candidate going all over the place. So you can see all the people that way. Okay. Questions from anybody? Uh, for second round interviews, will it be based on their availability like it was the first time around? You will contact them? Typically, what I, typically what I will do is um, go to the person who had the last choice in the first round and say, tell me which day works best for you. And then I'll go to the person who had the, the first selection um, last and say, which day works best for you. Is it possible to do the interviews on the same evening like we did two last night? I would say no. Okay. Um, just simply because you want each candidate to come and spend the full day in the district and finish that okay. day with the board. And if you have them both, then they're going to be disjointed in terms of Mike, what is the format you used to, to get representatives from these groups here to the staff? It, it was very scientific. I called Pat and said, sign them up. <laughs> Simple as that. I gave her a list of stakeholder groups that I typically would see. And I said, I'd like you to try to schedule me some people in each of these groups along the way. And, and again, there's no way I know who any of those folks were before I had a chance to meet with them last Well, I'd just like to see us try to arrange for somebody who really has an interest in, in attending that. I'd like us to s do what we can to get them here. Sure. Like, teachers are going to be teaching, but if there's a way for us... Well, we met with, I met with teachers at the elementary level, and I met with teachers from the secondary level as part of that. So anybody who was a classroom teacher at the elementary level had the opportunity to come. Anybody who was a secondary teacher had the opportunity to come, and it would be the same way. I mean, yeah. now they're going to come to here. The same thing. So we're we meeting them here? Yes. Oh, okay. You betcha. It was the end of the work day. Okay. We scheduled time Good. frames for them Good. as their day closed. All right. I thought there was a No. Good. So it's the same format. Yeah, but Does anyone know? Have we have a board meeting Wednesday, correct? To regularly. I'm going to say, do we have to have everything like next week? Like, is there a way to spread it out a little bit more? Is it for a timing standpoint? Yeah, we have to stay on our. I think. No, we, I think we want to stay on our time frame. Mm -hmm. But I was just concerned about if you have a computer, if you could look at the scheduled meetings. I think there's. I thought you there do have one. We have one next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. So I would like to work around that. I would, you know, we're not having.
obviously going to be able to take. So the, sec the second interview is no. about an hour. Okay. And so what you might think about is uh, scheduling that interview immediately preceding your board meeting and then delay your board meeting until after that first interview. That's a possibility. We could do that and stick so, with, maybe stick with Wednesday and then yeah. Thursday. Yeah. When does that change in the need to be posted by? You get 24 hours in advance. I think we should um, get a time that we're going to do that. We'll figure out a time when we're going to move our board meeting to. Well, the board meeting should be able to stay the same if we could stay within our hour interview. Yeah, you can, you can post that as or... one meeting if you so choose. Yeah. We have the first item on the agenda, yeah. superintendent interview, all about the business. I have an idea. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah. Well, it's a public meeting, so we could leave the board meeting starting at 6.30 and just adjust the agenda. The first hour okay. of the meeting is the interview, and then when that's done, we just go right on with the agenda. So we don't have to change the time. We just change mm -hmm. the agenda. At least, yeah, I would prefer that rather than change the time. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. this going to be hard for him. And if there's, if there's, no. the agenda's overwhelmed already, we could probably postpone Lightness. an agenda item if there was something on there yeah. that we could mm -hmm. put off. I just think it's easier. Yeah. All right. And that vision is at 6.30? Yes. Yeah. So we'll schedule both of those second interviews at 6.30, one on Wednesday and one on Thursday. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Yeah. Can you speak more about the site visit and how it's planned? Well, that, that's, again, uh, your choice as to whether or not you want to do a site visit. Uh, I think there's value in a site visit, but that's ultimately your choice. If you said you wanted to do a site visit at the end of these two interviews, um, I would want to begin now telling candidates should I begin to think about a site visit. And I ask them to do a mirror image of what they see here on the day of that or second interview. I want them to arrange for some small groups from the same demographics that they meet with here in their home district. I want them to identify a confidential location where a visiting team of whatever size can meet with those small groups and say to them, when Ed Okonowski was in our district, he said that one of the things he does is this. Can you give me some evidence of how that looks here in Lance Cruz? I would want a site visit for the internal candidate as well as the external candidate. Mm -hmm. I would want to say to them, you go find that those representatives in that group. Uh, you schedule them. Here are the groups you schedule it. I want you to plan to have lunch with that visiting team. I want you to greet them when they arrive. Uh, I want you to stay out of their hair until the end of the day. At the end of the day, I want you to provide a confidential location for that visiting team to meet and debrief for perhaps an hour, if they so choose. And then when they're ready to leave, I want you to hand them a list of not less than 25 names and telephone numbers that are representative of the people that the visiting team sees during the day, but not the same people. And the reason I, I want that is because I know when you're in my house, you're going to hear what I want you to hear. Mm -hmm. But if I have a list and I can talk to people away from here and I can do it confidentially, I might get a totally different story. So I want you to see both. Would you be at the site visits with us? Not usually. Okay. I, we'll, we'll more than likely have to go through this information, decide if we want to do that. Schools are probably closed, so that will affect it. But if, if there's an interest, I suppose that could be put together mm -hmm. beginning of the week. Mm -hmm. Do we know if Pat's going out of the district right now? Like, will she be around to help coordinate some of this? Pat, she'll be back in the morning. Okay, so she'll be back tomorrow. Okay. Any more questions? None. So I, I would just say to you, I think you, you've done a good job. I think you vetted these two uh, applicants, or these three applicants, well. I think you made wise choices as you've narrowed your field. And I think your stakeholders in the community have played an important role in terms of providing the information. I think you know that, uh, would I give you a seven pages, single space to comments from all of the stakeholder groups mm -hmm. um, last week, and, and we had a chance to talk a little bit about those comments and what, what's really 
being reflected there. Their presence this evening, I think, speaks uh, highly of their interest uh, in the future leadership of the district. And um, hopefully we can continue to have their involvement and support as we go through the balance of the process. A reminder to you and a reminder to them that this is a process, not an event. Mm -hmm. And each step along the way, you'll gain more information about candidates. It's not who had the best interview, it's who prevails at the end of the process. Who can come out and demonstrate that they're best prepared to lead this organization on the new future. So can we just sort of recap what we're thinking now? So, so Wednesday is the 25th, so we're thinking that's our normal board meeting at 6.30, we would meet with one of the candidates at that point. Right. And then on Thursday the 26th, we'd meet with the second candidate at right. 6.30. And by the time we met them, we would have all the stakeholder yep. focus group information. Yep. Okay. Okay. And, and again, at that point, the only decision is um, do we do site visits or don't we? And, and if we decide to do site visits, we move forward. If you don't do site visits, then it's establishing a time at which you want to make a selection. If you want to do site visits shortly after those site visits, you should be prepared to make a decision and expect that that site visiting team is going to present an oral report, tell you what they saw, what they think, and why, um, and then then make a decision. If you're going to do a site visit, is it possible to do it that Friday? Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to check. I mean, I, I think if you're going to do a site visit, you need to do two. I would not advise you to do one. If you do one, the other the other candidate's going to withdraw right away. So uh, I think if you decide you want to do site visits, you need to do two. Uh, you need to go to both places. You need to ask each candidate to do the same thing uh, in order to have balance in the process. Okay, and you ought to try to send the same people to both places so that they can can see and give you. But, you know, an honest read as to the similarities or differences that they see. Anyone else? Um, if we want to contact references, are we, do we do that as individual board members? Do we just appoint people to call different people? How here's, does that work? here's what I would say to you. Um, I have contacted references for you in advance of these first interviews. Um, wait until you decide to do a site visit and you get another 25 names because you're going to wind up wanting to call all of those people, I would think. And typically, you might divide those up amongst yourselves uh, so that one person doesn't wind up with seven or eight phone calls mm -hmm. along the way. Anybody else? Uh, Joyce, I always look for tertiary references. Mm -hmm. uh, if you give me a name, I know pretty much what that person's probably going to tell me. Mm -hmm. So I want to know somebody who knows that person and say, well, what can you tell me and what am I really getting? Am I getting a clear, clear read here or am I getting a smoke screen? So if you know people who know those references... Mm -hmm. Like one's a board member in Troy and I sure. happen to work call. Right. So I thought about, but I didn't want to like overstep. So. Yeah, I, I just be cautious in that. Okay. Right. That's all I have for you. Okay, very okay. good. Meeting adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.